Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a book event with the Competitive Enterprise Institute and best-selling author, Matt Ridley. Matt is joining us from his home in England, where he serves in the House of Lords and writes frequently for major news journals on both sides of the Atlantic. A genuine polymath, Matt's expertise includes science, evolution, the history of ideas, as well as economics and law. As a reminder to everyone, and in keeping with a promise that Matt made last week on the internet, we're going to include as many questions from the audience as possible. If you have a question today, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Today, we'll be talking about his new book, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. Matt, thank you for being with CEI once again. Many of our audience will know that you are the winner of CEI's 2012 Julian L. Simon Memorial Award. I think if we were giving an award today, it would be for the timeliest contribution to understanding advances in public health. Welcome. Ken, thank you very much for having me on the show. The Julian Simon Award is right there over my left shoulder. Um, and um, uh, I am extremely proud of it. It's made of the five metals that were involved in the famous bet between Julius, Julian Simon and uh, um, uh, Paul Ehrlich. So uh, I'm Really thrilled to be with you and to talk about my new book, How Innovation Works. Before we get into some of the topical issues that are driving the headlines, I, I want to start with the basics, which is what motivated you to tackle this subject? It seems that innovation is something we all think we understand. Uh, I mean, who doesn't love new and useful things? Why, why do we need a whole book uh, uh, about it? Well, uh, the, the answer is that I think it's the most important topic about human beings there is, because it's responsible for our uh, current prosperity. It's, it's responsible for the great enrichment of the last couple of hundred years. Um, it's far more important than uh, expropriation or uh, expansion of the population or anything like that. You know, the reason we've seen incredible changes in the world uh, and incredible increases in people's living standards at the same time is because of innovation. So it's quite important that we try and understand that process. And I've danced around it for in a couple of books, The Rational Optimist and The Evolution of Everything um, are books which have a sort of sideways look at innovation uh, while looking at something else. And I thought to myself, I want to stop and I want to actually look at this topic. What is innovation? Why does it happen to people? Why doesn't it happen to other animals? Um, uh, why does it happen in some places and at some times? Um, what is so special about it? And why does it happen in certain technologies and so on? And I've had a, a really good go at this. And I think I've I decided to tell the stories in a different way, to tell, tell tales about innovations that change the world, the stories of who was involved in inventing them, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and what the struggles they went through. And I, so I think I've done a really, really interesting book about this, this topic that is both uh, a sort of essay about how this thing happens, but also an entertaining read about uh, interesting people in history doing interesting things. Um, and, you know, I genuinely think it's my best book uh, and uh, will be a huge bestseller. But that's thanks to efforts of people like you to kindly let me on your show. Now, I, I want to, I really want to dig into some of these stories and the people behind it. But before we get there, there's an important preface that we need to, to tackle. And this is the distinction you make a very important distinction between invention and innovation. And there's this framework, these ingredients, if you will, for innovation. Help, help us understand where the conversation is going about what is necessary for innovation and why is it different than invention in your view? Yeah, well, uh, I think we tend to focus on the development of an original prototype of a new device rather than the long and often difficult struggle to make that prototype into something that is useful, practical, available, and affordable to, to people. And that's what I mean by innovation, not just the invention of a new device, but, the, but actually making it uh, available to people so that they can afford it and, and want to use it. Um, and that's a, a hugely important process. We tend to think of the sort of upstream original idea as being the difficult, important thing, but actually that's often not the case. It's often the, the real geniuses are the people who put enormous amount of effort uh, into turning, some, turning an idea into something genuinely practical um, uh, and, and, and useful. So that's my, my focus is to 
to try and give the innovators credit rather than just the inventors. These are often businessmen. And we often say, well, yeah, of course, you made a lot of money out of this invention. Uh, but actually, uh, I think it's fair to say that an awful lot of work went into it. Thomas Edison is a very good example of an innovator who actually he didn't do that much original inventing. What he did was turn ideas into practical products. And he did so with a huge amount of hard work. He, as he once put it, uh, invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Um, and uh, so, you know, he tried 5,000 different plant materials before he settled on Japanese bamboo for the filament of the first light bulb that he produced. That's the kind of hard work that you need to do to do uh, innovation. Now, now, innovation, again, comes to us w with these characteristics. Um, you talk about serendipity, you talk about the governance structures, either for the organization or for the, the state. Um, the, the one that really, I think, might be counterintuitive to people, I want to jump ahead in your list of characteristics, is the effects of fewer resources, innovation leading to the use of fewer resources. And the, it's these counterintuitive things that I wanna really ask you to explain because they're, they're the joy of reading and understanding these new ideas. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting point that, that, you, that, that there's a lot of resistance to innovation in every age. The form it takes in the current age is to say, well, we can't afford to have innovation because we might run out of resources. We might run out of land or water or metal or, or something. Um, uh, if we do too much innovating, we're going to uh, destroy the planet. But actually, and, and you often hear the phrase, the line, um, uh, infinite growth on a finite planet is impossible. And superficially, that sounds true. But then when you think about it for a second, you think, well, hang on, if I invent a way of using less material in a building or less energy in a car, I'm using less material and less energy. Uh, so I'm actually reducing the amount of resources that go into keeping civilization going. Um, and so maybe innovation can also reduce our ecological footprint, our demand for resources, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And indeed it does. Look at the miniaturization of a lot of products that's happened in our lifetimes. Look at the incredible increases in fuel efficiency of vehicles, etc. Uh, look at how much less electricity you need for, to get lighting today than you did in the days of compact, uh, of compact fluorescent bulbs or incandescent bulbs. And it turns out that if you look at the US or the UK economy now, they are using absolutely less stuff than they were when they had smaller populations 20 years ago. Not just less stuff per capita, but less stuff overall. And you work this out by looking at the amount of uh, metals and minerals and so on that are mined, but also imported. And you try and add it all up, um, and all the electricity you need, et cetera, et cetera. And you find that, hang on, we're actually using less stuff. Beautiful example of this, of course, is the use of less land. We need 68% less land to grow a given quantity of food as we did uh, about 50 years ago. Well, um, we, we should add, uh, we should not gloss over. There's an important attribute. We're not only using less stuff, but we're living better healthier, Absolutely. safer, more diversity yeah. in our food choices. All of these things have improved. So you, you referenced the great enrichment, which I don't want to lose track of. Could you just explain that for a moment for some of our audience that might not be familiar with uh, yeah. Professor McCloskey? The great enrichment is a phrase uh, invented by Deirdre McCloskey, one of the great economic historians. And what she argues is that uh, over the last uh, 200 years, um, the average per capita income on the planet has rocketed upwards in a way that simply hasn't happened before. And at the same time, the number of people living in extreme poverty has rocketed downwards. Uh, and it, this has accelerated even more in the last 50 years than before. So I've been on this planet for 62 years so far. And in that time, the percentage of the world population that lives in extreme poverty that's less than $1.90 a day, uh, has gone from 
about 65% when I was born to about 7 or 8% today. That's extraordinary. Nobody has ever lived through a transformation as remarkable as that. Um, now, there's a lot of people in extreme poverty still, and there's even more people in slightly less extreme poverty. But when I first wrote The Rational Optimist 10 years ago uh, and said, you know, things have been getting better and probably will go on getting better, people would say to me things like, well, that might be true of Asia, but it's not going to be true of Africa. There's no way you can lift all these Africans out of poverty. Well, the last 10 years has seen extraordinary advances in the uh, living standards of average Africans. So uh, Ethiopians and Mozambicans have roughly doubled their income per capita um, uh, in the last 10 years. People in the West have not seen such a good 10 years, and that means that global inequality is going down because the poor are getting rich much faster than the rich are getting rich. Now, where does this incredible great enrichment come from? It comes from innovation comes from spreading innovations that were made a long time ago to from the Western world to the rest of the world, but it also comes from new innovations uh, elsewhere in the world. Now, elsewhere in the world, let's, let's take that and go with that for just a moment. Uh, you, you discuss how innovation requires, um, ideas are recumbent, right? They're, they're taken apart and put together pieces here and there, and it doesn't really matter where the idea comes from. Uh, but the good and the benefit, the innovation itself, can be applied anywhere at all. Is that, um, I'm, I'm gonna start to edge our way toward contemporary issues, is that at risk? We're, we're seeing less interest in travel, in trade, in the exchange across borders and across continents. W where are we with our risk profile when it comes to innovation looking ahead? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I argue that innovation has always happened where ideas can have sex um, and produce baby ideas. Um, and that's because if you look at most technologies, they are combinations of other technologies. We simply recombine the atoms of the world uh, in different combinations to produce most of the innovations we, we, we use. And that happens because somebody in one part of the world has an idea and somebody in another part of the world has an idea and the two ideas meet and mate and produce another idea. Um, and you can see that this is why innovation happens in trading uh, countries and trading city-states. So the Renaissance Ital Italian city-states or um, Victorian Britain at the hub of a great trading network or California today. And today, because of the internet, an idea in Shanghai can meet an idea from San Francisco and have a baby idea in London um, in the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, in a second or two. It can happen incredibly quickly. Um, so we, are, we have lived through a period where global connectivity has allowed ideas to, to, to meet and to flourish. And that's been very important. That's fed the, the stream of ideas. Now, today we live in a time where there are people are turning their, their backs on free trade to some extent. Um, uh, and there is a degree of desire to move back to national self-dependence self for things. Just think if we really took that seriously, what that would mean. It would mean that if my country invented a vaccine for COVID-19 and yours didn't, or vice versa, that whoever didn't live in the country where it was invented would never be allowed access to it because we'd have a trade barrier saying, no, you can't have our vaccines. Do we really want that? Do we really think that this, the vaccine that ends this epidemic, if that's what does end it, or it might be an antiviral cure, or it might be a, 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 a smart app that allows us to do smart social distancing. Do we really think that we only want to get access to that if it's invented in our own country? Of course not. So that immediately brings you to the benefits of globalization, the benefits of having access to a vaccine wherever it's developed. And the same is true of every other product on the planet. Just because I live in Britain, doesn't mean that I should uh, have to be confined to things that are invented in Britain any more than just because I live in a certain village, I should confine myself to the things that are invented or made in my village. 
So we do have to try and keep the, the advantages of globalization while recognizing that we live in a world where there, there is some tension uh, because of uh, the, particularly in the relationship between China and America, over what has happened recently and indeed over what has happened uh, in previous years as well. So if we can sort those out and keep globalization going, then everybody will benefit. I want to um, want to pull down a little bit, uh, bring us back to, I mentioned some of the wonderful stories you tell. There, there's a wonderful humanist element to the way you've approached this topic in getting into who the people are behind not just taking the ideas or combining the ideas, but really making practical use of them, marrying service to others, either through a market or uh, there's some wonderful examples, particularly in vaccines where, where people are doing the research not because they mean to commercialize it, but simply to improve the world. Can you talk about the characteristics of innovators themselves, the tinkerers, the the experimenters, and you started to touch on this with Edison, but I think there's a lot more yeah. there. Well, one of the things I wanted to do was get away from the idea that innovators are necessarily geniuses. Actually, because once you adopt that idea, you start, you start to put people off. You, you start to tell people, no, you can't become an innovator because you're just, you know, you're, you're not a genius. You're not at the top of your class. Well, I don't think actually, that you need to be particularly clever. You need to be good at networking, at thinking of ideas, at testing ideas, at coming up with ideas, and, and about, above all, trying experiments and learning from them. And all sorts of people can do that. So, I mean, you mentioned vaccines. I write in the book about two rather remarkable women who left teaching to go into bacteriology in the US Midwest in the 1920s, Pearl Kendrick and Grace Eldering. And they ended up uh, working in public health in Michigan uh, in the early 1930s. Nothing very remarkable about them. Um, but they, uh, there was a serious whooping cough um, epidemic at the time. It was one of the biggest killers of children of the, of the era. Uh, and they said, we want in our spare time to try and develop a vaccine against this terrible disease. Uh, and their bosses were uh, prepared to let them do this. Uh, and they, uh, inch by inch, using relatively straightforward vaccine development me measures, nothing particularly fancy, they developed a vaccine. And they tested it rather brilliantly. And by this time, they had got to know all these uh, terribly deprived neighborhoods in the Great Depression where this disease because of the quarantine regulations was causing deprivation as well because if you you know if there was a case then the family had to stay at home locked down and so on um, uh, and they they had worked out how to test this vaccine rather cleverly um, uh, by matching by, by giving it to as many children as they could but finding children who they hadn't reached who matched these children so as to prove that that more of this lot were, were stay were get, no, more of this lot were getting the disease than, than the vaccinated lot um, so you know there's nothing about that story that anyone couldn't have done they just worked hard and thought carefully about it they didn't need right. a huge amount of money uh, they never made any money they were never famous uh, they within four short years their vaccine had been adopted, became a worldwide success, almost wiped out whooping cough. It's an extraordinary story. I think there's something else that you almost said there uh, that is really important about that, that anecdote. Uh, there was a stick to itiveness. They had grit. And that, I mean, there were experts brought in to pick apart their study, their methodology. No one believed them. And they had the confidence and courage to keep going. Um, that is absolutely it's really extraordinary. Yeah, no, a, a degree of pig-headed obstinacy is useful. I will admit that. You know, there, there are psychological features that you need, and one of them is to be absolutely determined to keep trying, but not to not to be so pig-headed that you never learn from your mistakes. 
Uh, there are certainly people who do that. I mean, in the book, I, I tell the story of the Wright brothers, which is very well known, of course. Uh, but I also tell the story of the rival project at exactly the same time, which had huge amount of government funding, was, was done by a very famous scientist. And he was going to develop powered flight. He was called uh, Samuel Langley. Uh, he was head of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. He was very well connected. He got a huge amount of money from the government. Um, and he decided that he was going to invent the airplane secretly on his own with a team of people that he told what to do. Whereas the Wright brothers uh, wrote to everybody they could think of who'd ever built a glider or who'd ever studied this flight of birds, gleaned as much information as they could, put it together, did a bunch of experiments with gliders and other things, built a wind tunnel, went to North Carolina every summer to test out their ideas and inch by inch put together um, something that could uh, achieve powered flight, uh, having learnt from every mistake they'd made. Samuel Langley's machine was unveiled for its first flight, having never been experimented with, uh, and crashed into the Potomac after 20 feet, um, destroying the government's uh, faith in support for that kind of technology uh, 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 championship, as it were. So it's a very nice example of how to do it right and how to do it wrong. Let, let's talk a little bit about, um, this, is, this is actually driven by our first question from the audience. Gary is asking about risk aversion. And um, you, you mentioned what happened there when the government backed Langley. The project failed. There's a very similar story about uh, the development of flight in England, uh, seeking flight, of transatlantic flight with uh, dirigibles, I believe it was. Um, innovations, they run into headwinds, figur of, figuratively and literally. People are averse to them. We have uh, Sabots and the Luddites and government agencies that are risk averse. How do we get over that risk aversion, those initial hurdles, so that we have more stories like the Wright brothers and fewer stories where people just pack it all in and say it's not worth doing? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a myth to think that uh, opposition to innovation is new. We tend to look around the world and see, you know, Greenpeace trying to stop genetically modified organisms that could save children's lives. And we say, this is a terrible new thing. But actually, innovations have been opposed by people pretty well throughout history. Uh, and there's always been a combination of a vested interest, some company that would lose out or some uh, sec section of manufacturers or something that would lose out, um, a, uh, a worried uh, ruler, uh, a king or a government that says, I'm not sure this new technology is a good idea because it might uh, liberate people to think for themselves and things like that. Um, uh, and a, a, a sort of um, risk averse pressure group that's saying this might be dangerous. So they all came together, for example, in opposition to coffee. And I tell the story of how coffee was an innovation that reached uh, the Middle East and Europe uh, around 1500 from Africa and caught on very quickly, but was immediately banned everywhere. It was banned in Cairo, it was banned in Istanbul, it was banned in Marseille, it was banned in Paris, it was banned in London. Um, but very ineffectively, people found a way around this, it kept, kept coming back, they had to keep banning it again, etc. Um, and um, uh, when you look at why, uh, there was a, uh, you know, in Marseille, for example, the wine industry funded a scientific study of how coffee was bad for you. It dried up your, your liver and your kidneys, apparently. I mean, this was complete pseudoscientific nonsense, but uh, you can get scientists to say what you ask them to. Medics, these were probably not, it was probably unfair to call them scientists in the, in the 1600s. Um, uh, uh, but so, uh, you know, there's that motivation. But then in London in the 1670s, King Charles II bans coffee houses. Why? Because people keep gathering in coffee houses and talking. And this is terribly dangerous. They might talk about how the king is not doing a good job. And that would be a bad thing. So they must be banned. And he's quite explicit about that being his reason. Um, so, um, uh, it, there's nothing new about these kind of uh, oppositions to um, uh, uh, new technologies. But, 
and it, it seems that there's a, a practical corollary, a uh, very different approach to uh, harm reduction and tobacco and vaping in Britain versus here in America. Uh, the coalition of efforts, the public health expertise that actually is simply propping up their own role as opposed to... Yeah. Uh, no, I think vaping is a very nice contemporary example of, of a technology invented in China in, in the early 2000s by a man trying to give up cigarettes because he'd seen his father die of lung cancer, a man named Hon Lick. Um, and he tries to spread this idea of the electronic cigarette around the world and it catches on in all sorts of places. And of all the countries that adopted it, most very quickly either banned it or made it very difficult for, for vaping. Uh, and they did so either because they had a strong tobacco industry lobby or because they had a strong pharmaceutical industry lobby, which uh, didn't like the idea of a competitor for patches and gums, um, uh, or because they had a strong public health lobby, which just hated the tobacco industry so much that they didn't like the idea of anything that even looked like smoking. But one country, the UK, happened to let the um, genie out of the bottle. Um, so, uh, and, and this was because of a deliberate policy decision to be permissive about this. In 2010, David Cameron had newly got elected uh, and he was employing uh, somebody called David Halpin to run something called the Nudge Unit. Um, and uh, he, was, he had a friend called Rory Sutherland who's an advertising executive and he was an early adopter of, an e of e cigarettes. And he pulled one out and puffed on it while talking to David Halpin. And Halpin said, what on earth is that? And uh, Rory Sutherland explained that this was this new way of getting nicotine, which was bound to be far lower risk than um, uh, cigarettes. And so it was a good thing. And sure enough, Halpin told Cameron not to ban it when the public health lobby came along and asked to ban it, as they inevitably did quite soon after that. Uh, and so a really vigorous industry developed in the UK and about 3 million Brits now vape, which is not much less than the number that smoke. And smoking has declined much steeper in the UK than anywhere else, uh, etc. in Europe. Um, but what the British government did, which it did quite well, is it while it allowed this technology and it actually encouraged it, it now has public health campaigns saying, if you want to quit, this is one of the ways to do it. It also brought in rules for product safety so that you wouldn't get a black market developing in dangerous forms of vaping. The American way was much more, we hate this so much, we're just going to try and prohibit it. And because we're trying to prohibit it, there's no point in passing laws about whether the products should be safe or not. Um, so you've ended up, as you did with prohibition 100 years ago, um, making a technology more dangerous because in the US, indeed, vaping products have now killed people because they are using inappropriate substances uh, in inappropriate ways, because there's no legal market of, relative, of safe products which people want to keep safe. So it's a very nice example, that, of two countries taking a different approach. I'm not here to say Brits do everything right and Americans do everything wrong, but on that one issue of harm reduction, partly because Britain tried an experiment with handing out free needles to drug addicts during the HIV epidemic, which was very unpopular at the time, but proved to be a good way of reducing harm, even though it seemed to be endorsing drug use. Um, partly because of that, Britain has almost bought the argument for harm reduction. It's a difficult argument to make to the public, but it is one that can be made. It is, you stress there that the government chose a policy to, uh, to be permissive, to allow this experimentation. I think that's important. There's a corollary to that, and they trusted individuals to make risk assessments for themselves about their own lives and what they would ingest. And uh, that's something that I think is another way of understanding what happens and how the government interacts with the electorate or the people that they're trying to govern. Absolutely. And, and just to give you a, a good an example of, of doing it wrong and the UK doing it as wrong as anyone, um, the, the whole story of the compact fluorescent light bulb is a shocking example of governments forcing consumers to adopt a technology they weren't keen or willing to do. Um, so um, the... Um, uh, um, uh, hang on one sec. He has been fed.
My dog has been fed. It just that was an important piece of information for my wife. <laughs> we both had an interruption, I think. Um, yeah, I, I have a neighbor child who's not entirely pleased with this, this program. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice sound. Um, uh, let, let me see if I can move into uh, some rapid fire questions. I've got a queue building up from, our, from your, I'm sorry. your yes, audience I'm, I'm and too long. fans. Um, uh, Ravi asks if you could reconcile, how do we reconcile free trade with rogue nations, Cuba, China, that might benefit the, those in power as much as it benefits us as we trade with them? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think this is a very good and difficult question. Uh, you know, if you trade freely with um, a country, you, on the whole, uh, deliver it some prosperity, and that prosperity might enable the ruler to uh, benefit. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, in the end, you also build a bridge to that country, and it's the people of that country you're trading with, not the government. I think that's a very important distinction. And, uh, the, you know, the, the evidence shows that countries that trade more are less likely to go to war with each other. That's much more important than whether they're both democracies, uh, curiously. Um, and so uh, it, 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 far, it, it, it is actually a pretty good way of undermining an unsavory regime uh, to, is to um, make sure that you are freely trading with, with that other country. So Cuba and China are two good examples, because in the case of Cuba, the United States chose not to trade with Cuba for a very long time. Did it undermine and cause the regime to collapse? No, it didn't. It just punished the Cuban people, arguably. China, um, America has traded freely with China to the great benefit of both sides of the equation. I think it's important to realize that, you know, American consumers have enormously benefited from cheap manufacturing in China and so on. Um, uh, and that, for a while, led to a, an increasingly open society in China. At the is, moment, is there, we've now is, got the opposite happening, a, 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 a regime in China that is far more authoritarian uh, and dirigist, and I think that spells trouble. Is there evidence that one or the other strategy uh, tends toward the improvement of the rule of law in the trading partner? If you assume that the partner is a rogue nation, does trading versus not trading, uh, is there evidence that suggests one leads toward stronger rule of law in that nation? I think the evidence suggests that over the long period, this might not work in a short time, but over a long period, the, um, uh, the, the, the two countries that trade with each other will tend to uh, drive out bad legal practices. So if you look at sort of medieval trade in Europe, the sort of Hanseatic merchants and people like that, they basically, your, you know, your credit was only as good as your reputation. Uh, and, you know, you had to uh, stick to your promises and obey the law uh, and agree to be um, uh, judged by the law if you were to be welcome in, you know, Antwerp or Hamburg or wherever it was you were traveling to next. Um, so it does, on the whole, spread good practice. Now, if you take a modern example, China's attitude to intellectual property is often very lacking in uh, um, respect for uh, the legal tradition uh, in the West. And that is a problem. And if it was more respectful of that, it would get more trade. It's as simple as that. But I actually share quite a lot of skepticism about whether our intellectual property system is a good idea. On the whole, I see it as a barrier to innovation and a barrier to trade. So I think we're far too restrictive about intellectual property. And to some extent, uh, I say that in this one particular area, undermining copyright and patent isn't quite such a bad thing. I say that as an author who makes money off copyright. So it's a little hypocritical, but there we go. Jerry asks us, uh, wh why we might be on the brink of an innovation famine. So I, th I think he's at least partway through the book. So that's a one, one sale to be notched. Tell <laughs> us about the innovation famine. Yeah, well, one of the last chapters in the book uh, is called The Innovation Famine. And in it, I argue uh, that far from living in a period of abundant, accelerating, continuous innovation, 
we might actually be living in a period when innovation is going too slowly. And you can only see that all too easily if you look at the state of vaccine development, which is far too slow, or the state of development of medical diagnostic devices, which take many months, even years, to get approval by the government. Um, uh, and if that, hadn't be, if that had been a faster process, then we'd have more devices with which to fight this particular pandemic. So um, I, I do genuinely think that because of intellectual property, because of regulation, uh, because of uh, 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 lots of other factors, we have put obstacles in the way of innovators, particularly in the West, that have made it tough to bring forward new innovations. Um, and it's quite worrying how much we're doing that and how much we have been doing that. Peter Thiel oh, well. makes the point that, that we, we innovate readily in the digital era, era, area, but we don't re re readily innovate in uh, real uh, tangible products. And you know, so it's much, much harder to develop new drugs than it used to be. And think of what we're missing out on because of that. The one area that you do dive into uh, quite thoroughly, I, I found, was the barriers that are created by legal jurisdictions. And so we have a question from Joe. Uh, he asks if increasing the number of jurisdictions competing to attract innovators, would that accelerate the rate of innovation? And I think married with that is, a, is maybe if you could give us a discussion about the role of empire. Uh, which has its corollary within organizations for large bureaucratic structures. Yes. Well, uh, I'm rather down on empires. Uh, I think they have a poor track record of encouraging innovation. You get enormous empires with enormous wealth uh, and a huge amount of trade inside them and yet very little innovation. Something like the Ottoman Empire, something like the, uh, the Ming Empire in China. Um, these were empires that inherited a, a fl flourishing innovation system and basically killed it. Uh, and they killed it by too much bureaucratic top-down centralization, too much telling merchants what they could and couldn't do, too much uh, demand, uh, demanding that people apply for licenses before they try something new. Um, whereas fragmented uh, city-states like ancient Greece or Renaissance Italy, um, uh, or the Netherlands uh, at, at, at their height, or the American states, the federal system of the United States, have proved to be much better at innovation. Why? Because they're competition. They're basically competing for the attention of wealth creators, saying, come and live in my regime because I will treat you better than the other lot, uh, and then you, I can have the benefit of, of your work here. Um, and so we see this. We see people like Gutenberg, the inventor of of printing moving from one city to another to try and find a congenial regime in which he can do his innovating. And we see it today. Just the other day, Elon Musk was threatening to leave California for Texas because he doesn't like the regime that California is imposing. So um, uh, it, competition among different legal jurisdictions is very important to keep them from uh, killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. Now you will notice that that is a good reason for Britain leaving the European Union, because increasingly the European Union has become a nascent empire. That is to say, it's trying to impose one-size-fits-all rules from a central administration. It doesn't believe in what we call mutual recognition, where, which is the way you know, the UK trades with the US, for example. You say, look, if, if this food is safe enough for you, it's safe enough for us. And we say, if it's safe enough for you, then it's safe enough for us. We don't care whether you're using the same rules. We just say the end result is you've, you've approved it. it. The European Union is not like that. It says, no, no, the rule must be the same in every country and must be enforced in the same way. Uh, and that allows for no experimentation. It means that you don't get uh, a ferment of different ways of doing things, different ways of achieving the same result, which is what leads to innovation. And it's no accident that Europe hasn't been able to spawn the kinds of digital innovation, the kinds of biotechnology innovation that both America and China have at a similar level of wealth and with similar populations. So we have uh, empires of land and force, but also empire of regulation that can have these negative effects. I, I see uh, from one innovative technology, my iPhone, as we speak, we have some homeschoolers uh, watching live today. We'll also be 
we'll be posting this entire conversation on YouTube and circulating it that way. But I, I wanted to ask you, particularly for that audience, the, the post-event audience that will consume this information over time, how do, we, uh, how do we dig into science? You've been writing very clearly about science for a long time and helping people get at the root of it without being expert in the field itself. It seems to me that a lot of students today struggle with their primary source of information is the internet and you can't always uh, have confidence in what you're reading on the internet is grounded in real science. So how, how is a scientifically curious reader and learner to get going today? What would you recommend for that person? It's a really good question. And on the one hand, if you say, don't ever read anything unless it's by a, 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 a credentialed scientist who knows, you know, who's teaching at a university or something, then you'll end up directing people to a lot of stuff that might or might not be right, but it might or might not be interesting to read. There are commentators out there. Science needs commentators and critics, you know, the, the critic in the term, the, the way the art world needs, people who discuss it, people who write about it, people who um, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, watch it and cheer it on, but are critical sometimes of some of its uh, ideas. So um, I, I think um, that it is, uh, it, it, science is fantastic. It is the greatest human achievement bar none. The fact that we know the structure of the universe, the fact that we know the age of the earth and what happened in times past, the ha fact that we know what a gene is in the middle of a cell, these are incredible, wonderful things that we have discovered, far more exciting than any... Um, uh, than anything else in in the in the in the culture in my view so this is a fantastic corpus of knowledge and it's a fantastic source of new mysteries what you need to do to uh, keep up with it is learn a certain amount you have to put in a little bit of hard work it's not easy to sort of walk into a new discipline like virology and expect to understand it straight away but at the same time you don't need to get bogged down in every detail um, uh, and always check. So if you find something that's really interesting, a really interesting essay on a virus or something like that, um, read it, enjoy it, and then go and check it. Check whether other people are agreeing with it or not. Because uh, eventually you'll find somebody who says, this is rubbish, um, he's all wrong, and here are my reasons. And those reasons might be persuasive and they might be very good reasons, in which case you're right to reject your original uh, liking of that essay. But they might not. They might, like a bad TripAdvisor review, actually tell you, you know, I've read TripAdvisor reviews that told me don't go to such and such a hotel. And I've, the reasons given were ones that made me think, well, actually, you know, they say things like it's too quiet. I quite like a quiet hotel. Do you see what I mean? So, so actually... If, if you're reading people criticizing each other within science, making sure you read both sides of every argument, then you will eventually make up your own mind about which side to believe. So that's the really important thing, I think, for young people today, is never to stick to one side of the argument, never to just read more and more of the same view. Go out there and find Professor X, who thinks Professor Y is talking nonsense, and read them both. That's my advice. Wonderful. Skepticism married to curiosity. Correct. Uh, we, have a qu we have a question from Leonardo uh, about... The Leonardo. Uh, <laughs> a Leonardo asks about <laughs> automation and the destruction of jobs. And you have a, a nice uh, explanation of this as it relates to driving and automated vehicles. Uh, what is the role for government in the either protection of current jobs or preparing people to move into new fields? I think uh, government uh, needs to uh, be aware of the, uh, the, 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 the need for retraining. Uh, and this is always true and always will be true. And it's much better to say, we're gonna help firms retrain people than to say we're going to help firms hang on to old professions because we've shed the vast majority of jobs in agriculture many jobs in manufacturing and lots of jobs in services and yet 
there are more jobs than ever. More people are employed than ever before. Unemployment is very low. At every stage in the last 200 years, there have been people saying automation, invention, innovation is bad for jobs. It's going to destroy work. It's going to leave people high and dry. And that just doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because the reason jobs exist is to supply the needs of people who want needs supplied. And they will, if they are better off as a result of automation, have more needs to supply. So, you know, um, back in the 18th century, there wasn't much call for pet grooming salons because people couldn't really afford enough money to waste on things like that. There is today. Likewise, in the 18th century, there were no such things as flight attendants or software engineers because neither industry had been invented. So technology invents new jobs as well as gets rid of them. And it provides us with the opportunity to think of new services that we would like to acquire from other people um, uh, and go out and, and, and so Those new services, those new products, that is the engine, the conveyor belt, if you will, of that great enrichment, bringing Correct. us ever, ever greater uh, quality of life. I, I have a question uh, about uh, science itself as it relates to policy. Um, you know, there's this idea that that it seems persistent within policy circles that if you invest in science the spin-off products will follow it originated uh, perhaps in the United States with Van Over Bush but there's there's doesn't seem to be evidence for it and I wonder if you could help us understand why that wrong idea sticks with us and and how we should think about the role of investment into science so uh, science can lead to technology and uh, uh, innovation, of course, uh, and it often does. But it's just as common to find the opposite happening, that a technology is developed and improved, and then to understand it, you have to go back to a university and ask a scientist to explain what's happening. So, for example, the steam engine led to uh, the understanding of thermodynamics, the dye industry led to the understanding uh, of chemistry. Um, we used vaccination for hundreds of years before we knew the science behind it. So it's not, it's not a linear phenomenon where you st always start with science and always end up with technology. It goes both ways. And many of the technologies that have been most innovative in our lifetime, things like mobile telephony and uh, internet and so on, many of them owe just as much to uh, industrial um, discovery as to academic discovery. It wasn't the discovery of new physical principles behind things that, that led to them. It was just developing the technology. Now, that's not to say that science is unimportant. Science is incredibly important. And as I've just said, I love science. I think it's the most thrilling thing there is. But I don't think we need to make funding of science dependent on science producing spin-offs. I think that's actually to devalue science, to say to Stephen Hawking, look, Dr. Hawking, this black hole stuff is all very well, but what's it going to do uh, for uh, mobile phones, eh? You know, you haven't thought of that, have you? Well, that would be the wrong way of approaching the science funding. So I think we need to liberate science from the insistence that it must produce technologies and often tell it, you know, you can help the people who are... In, you can benefit from the inventions that are being made. A very good example of this, which I give in the book, is, is uh, the CRISPR, which is the new genome editing technology developed just in the last 10 years. And superficially, when you look at it, it looks like it starts in universities, Berkeley and MIT, and then it ends up in the real world doing uh, agricultural and medical applications. But when you look into it close, more closely, the Berkeley and MIT teams got the technology, got the idea from work that was partly sponsored by the yogurt industry because the yogurt industry was trying to understand how to make bacteria resistant to viral infections. Um, and they stumbled on this extraordinarily precise uh, DNA sequence recognizing device that bacteria use to identify their enemies. Uh, and they realized that this could be repurposed uh, into a genome editing technology. So that's an idea that has jumped backwards and forwards between science and technology throughout its development. One thing I've uh, taken a small pleasure in in the last hour is I, I took the liberty of reading through the acknowledgments of your book. 
And you have this wonderful habit through your, your research and writing of interacting with uh, people all over the world. There's dozens and dozens of, of references to leading scholars, but also practical people, people that are out running businesses, people that are out uh, developing the institutions. And I think this is now the third question that is coming in from someone who I recall seeing their name referenced somewhere in your book. Right. So your conversations uh, continue. These people want to keep engaged with you. And Josh is asking about, he's, he says, given the collapse of peer review to keep agenda-driven science out of the literature, the formal scientific process, and the refusal of many researchers to share data, what reforms would you suggest? Can, can you talk about a red team, blue team framework? Again, this is bringing these big questions of science into the realm of policymaking so that we can better inform the rules that we make for society. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, explain this red team, blue team idea. Yeah, well, I think Josh is quite right that peer review is irredeemably corrupt and broken as a technology. The idea was that scientists would would uh, read each other's papers and 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 suggest corrections and and errors. And in fact, it's 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 turned into a gatekeeping system where they only allow uh, papers to be published that are um, that they approve of, uh, and they keep out people that they don't approve of, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of back scratching and so on. Um, uh, uh, and the alternative is to say what scientists are human beings and they try and prove their hypothesis to be right they don't try and prove it to be wrong which is what they ought to do because that's the best way of testing it but they try and prove it to be right they look for evidence that confirms it they don't look for evidence that might disconfirm it there's nothing wrong with that that's the way we all operate we get a bee in our bonnet and we go for it like a prosecuting attorney um, uh, but what keeps us honest in science is the fact that while you're doing that, somebody else in some other institution is saying that Ridley chap is, I'm sure he's wrong. I'm going to try and prove him wrong. So uh, they set out to try and prove me wrong. And that's what has kept science honest and kept science from falling into the conf confirmation bias trap so that it does produce objectively true results that can be trusted. The fact that A challenges B and says, I think your theory is rubbish. Here's an alternative theory. And, you know, as I say, we don't know who's going to win this argument, but we know that it's, it's, it's vital that you have the argument. The decentralized state of science is very important here. The fact that science is fragmented all over the country in lots of different universities, uh, and you're not dependent on Professor A, who you're attacking, you're dependent on some other institution. So that's been very important. So in that sense, a red team versus blue team approach has been inherent in science for decades, and that's what's made it work. In recent years, we've seen the development, particularly in climate science, of a tendency to say, no, everybody must be on the blue team. Everybody must adhere to a particular set of views, and we will not let anything into the literature that doesn't uh, conform to this. It's called the consensus. Um, uh, and I think that's very dangerous because I don't, I think that is what is making uh, climate science particularly uh, untrustworthy, unreliable these days. It's coming out with results that are, that turn out to, to be wrong and that have to be revised quite quickly. So, um, uh, we, we might think, have a topic for your next book. Uh, I, I'm seeing now, uh, the devil's advocate by Matt Ridley, the, the crisis of well, replication and trans replication and transparency in science. Well, the replication crisis is another part of this and a very, very important part and a great discovery by a number of very brave scientists. And it's been very hard work for them to get, get heard because you know what they found is that the literature is publishing uh, uh, statistical flukes and that can't be repeated. And these are then uh, taken as gospel for far too long. I know you have another obligation with our friends at the Adam Smith Institute uh, this evening there in England. I want to see if I can squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, Joe is asking if innovation is fundamentally unpredictable. And he adds, are angel investors flying blind? 
Um, in some ways, yes. I mean, if, if take, take the search engine. Uh, from here, looking backwards, it looks fantastically predictable that the search engine would be developed in the 1990s. But back in the 1980s, did lots of people sit around saying, you know what we need to invent? It's search engines. To a surprising extent, they didn't. Um, uh, they, even the Google guys didn't really think they were inventing a search engine at first. They thought they were cataloging the internet. So there is something remarkably unpredictable about uh, innovation. We don't see it coming and we find it very difficult to forecast it. And in my book, I have some gloriously wrong quotations from people like uh, Paul Krugman about how the internet is going to be a flash in the pan to people like Paul Allen, who's saying that there's no way the iPhone is going to get any market share, uh, you know, etc. cetera. Um, it turns out that we are really bad at understanding the future of technology. It requires, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard problem to use the philosophical uh, approach. So does that mean angel investors are wasting their time? Yes and no, because that doesn't mean that the short-term predictability of something, the, 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 the working out of a system that's already happening is unpredictable. So for example, Moore's law um, turned out to be very, very predictable remarkably sort of puzzlingly so in a way you know that the the, the 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 chips kept improving at this steady rate so if an angel investor is um forecasting something that's just around the corner and that has already begun then he's probably fine but if he's trying to say where we're going to be in 10 years and which technologies are going to win and which are not um he may be rolling dice now, I, I, I have a question that is uh, perhaps my favorite, and I'm going to see if I can answer it for you, but I'll give you a <laughs> chance. Uh, Derek asks, why is this so popular, and should I buy it now or later? Uh, Derek, I would like you to buy the book now, and then later buy another for a friend. Uh, it's a wonderful treatment of an important part of how we get through the world and contribute to this enrichment as well as very practical applications for the policy community, which is where I, I spend my energies. Uh, Matt, I want to thank you. This has just been a treat. It's been, um, had we been in the office due to uh, normal work conditions, copies of your book would have been a hot commodity as it turned out. I think we at CEI bought a couple extra and got them around to thank the you. staff. Thank you. Um, I do want to encourage people to continue to join us for these seminars. Next Wednesday on the 10th, uh, we'll be meeting with Professor Stephen Davies and our own Ian right. Murray. I'll be part of that panel as the American Voice. We'll have two, uh, two people joining us to talk about political disruption and changes in the way um, uh, political institutions are shaping up. I'm particularly interested in the aspects of populism. On the 22nd, we'll be back to our Repeal for Resilience series, focused on the regulatory state with OIRA Director Paul Ray and our own Wayne Cruz. And then finally, uh, late in the month, uh, earning a mention earlier in our commentary here, uh, Deidre McCloskey will be joining John Berlau for a discussion of his new book on entrepreneurship and George Washington. Uh, excuse me, July 7th. July 7th will be Deidre and John Berlau. So make sure to uh, plan to be available for those. We appreciate all the questions. It made my job a little bit more chaotic and certainly easier because I didn't have to come up with all the ideas. I was able to combine your ideas with Matt's work. Uh, this has been a wonderful program and I hope you'll Join us again in the future. Matt, continued success to you and good health. Thank you very much, Kent. I'm only sorry I can't now go and join you for a beer. <laughs> Next time. Thanks so much. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs>